Hello, and welcome to Freethought Blog's Conscience 2. I'm Jason Tebow, and it is 5 p.m. Central Time. Here to give us our welcome is Ed Brayton, founder of Freethought Blogs, and Dale McGowan of Parenting Beyond Belief. Take it away, gents. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, I will uh, try to do this while coughing as little as possible. Um, as, as most of my friends know, I've been deathly ill for weeks here. So, <clears throat> so I'll be muting myself when I'm not um, speaking so that I don't disturb everything. Uh, welcome to uh, FTBCon 2, uh, or as I prefer to call it, FTBCon 2 Electric Boogaloo, because I think the sequel to everything should be called uh, Electric Boogaloo. Uh, so before, uh, before I turn it over to Dale, I wanted to um, give a few uh, tips on how to attend the conference, which is going to be going on through uh, at least late Sunday afternoon. Um, the main conference website is at ftbcon.org, which has easy to access links uh, at the top of the right hand column under the header, very important links. Uh, the most current schedule is at the first link, which is at lanyard.com. Uh, on the lanyard schedule, each session will contain a link to the appropriate Google event page where the Hangout is being hosted. If you open that page, the video feed should automatically load when the panel starts broadcasting, and if you don't see it, reload the page. The Feringula chat room will be open for attendees to chat and ask questions of the panels if they have scheduled time for a question and answer session. We won't be having one here for the opening session. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> These questions will be relayed to the participants as they are asked. To get to the chat room, follow the links under very important links at ftbcon.org or go directly to tinyurl.com forward slash ftbcon. Some of our moderators may also be watching the conference Twitter hashtag, which is uh, hashtag ftbcon, but that's not guaranteed. They should tell you at the start of the session if they're watching the Twitter feed. Uh, per popular request from last year's uh, first uh, go at this, uh, we will be attempting to build in 10 to 15 minute breaks between panels. Uh, what's on the panel for an hour should only be 45 to 50 minutes. However, some panels may run long and we've got enough panels that many of them are scheduled against one another. And there's no scheduled lunch or supper break, so you still probably uh, not be able to watch it all live, but of course, since it's online, you can sit and eat while you're watching. Uh, don't worry though, you won't miss a thing. Every panel will be published <coughs> excuse me, to YouTube as soon as Google is done processing them, uh, and we'll be promoting those videos at freethoughtblogs.com for some time after the convention is over. Uh, so at this point, let me throw it over to Dale McGowan. Dale is uh, the author of Parenting Beyond Belief, the author of a brand new book which he's going to talk about. He also happens to be my boss, uh, with the foundation beyond belief, so I'm sucking up here. Uh, so, welcome, uh, Dale McGowan. Welcome. How are you doing, Ed? Glad to oh, be here. I've been better. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to start off by uh, just doing a very quick uh, plug for um, uh, Ed was talking about Foundation Beyond Belief. I wanted to mention that we are in the final days of a drive uh, for uh, a project in Haiti. Um, this is uh, the Pathfinders, uh, who are four humanists who are working their way around the world doing service projects in eight different countries. Um, they, we are uh, in the last week of a project to raise funds to build latrines in Haiti. It's not a very sexy sounding project, but it's a crucial one for the uh, town uh, that they're doing this, uh, uh, this work in, right on the border of the Dominican Republic. Um, it's uh, uh, something crucial to hop, uh, to stop spread the uh, 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 to spread uh, cholera, which is, has been spreading ever since uh, um, the earthquake. Uh, so, if you can uh, uh, chip in a few dollars, if you can go to donate.pathfindersproject.com, uh, we'd very much appreciate your support for that project. So, I just wanted to wanted to. Uh, put a pitch in for that. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to just uh, speak for a little bit about a book I have uh, coming out later this year, coming out in August. Um, this is actually the first time, first opportunity I've had to talk about the book. It was just, manuscript was just turned in about three weeks ago. Uh, the title is In Faith and in Doubt, and it is a uh, the first book on the secular religious mixed marriage, so marriages between uh, religious believers and non-believers. And uh, so I want to start off with a little bit of a personal um, um, 
perspective on that. Uh, when I uh, I'm, this is going to be about 15 or 20 minutes altogether, and then I'll throw it back to Ed. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I uh, met and fell in love with and married my wife Becca. And uh, in addition to being a whole lot of things that I was looking for, funny and intelligent, level-headed and, and beautiful, uh, she was something that I wasn't exactly looking for, which is a born and bred Southern Baptist. And uh, I, was, uh, I was present for her adult baptism ceremony. Her stepfather, uncle, and grandfather were Southern Baptist ministers. Uh, her parents met at a Baptist college. She went to church every week. This, this was a, a uh, Southern Baptist. But I wasn't worried about the mismatch because I knew her and I knew that despite the denomination she was not swimming in the crazy end of the religious pool. There are several ends of the pool as you know and uh, honestly I was so sure that this is the person I wanted to spend my life with that if I had found out she had a second head growing out of the back of her neck I would have bought it a little hat. Uh, compared to everything else that she brought to the table her religion was really a footnote for me. Um, and by the time we were married, she knew I was an atheist, but she didn't know that when we started dating. And uh, I sat next to her in church every Sunday, so there really wasn't any reason for her to assume that I wasn't a Christian. But I, uh, I knew it was just too big to come up years later as a kind of, you know, oh, by the way, the funny thing about me, you know, kind of deal. Uh, if it was going to be a big deal, it needed to be a big deal right there at the beginning before we got engaged. So... Um, one, we were living in Los Angeles, and one time we were driving to San Francisco, and I got up the nerve to bring it up while we were dating, and I figured a fast-moving car would be the right place to do it. Uh, so I said something like, uh, uh, you know, I don't believe in God. It's something I've thought about seriously for years. It's not likely to ever change. Is that okay with you? And uh, she clearly hadn't seen it coming, and she seemed a little shaken, and finally she said, uh, well, is it okay with you that I do believe? And I said, well, of course. I'd, I had known that from the beginning. So we talked for about an hour about what we both believed exactly. And that's a conversation that doesn't often happen. Well, it turned out she believed in God. She believed that Jesus was his son. But she was not a young earth creationist. She completely accepted evolution. She wasn't homophobic. She thought that all people are saved regardless of beliefs, which is not unusual Actually, 65% of U.S. Christians believe that non-Christians can end up in heaven. And most of those include the non-religious in the mix. So this is um, a helpful thing for this mix. The fact that most religious people don't believe what their churches say they should believe uh, is why this kind of mix actually can work and often does. So as we went down the list talking this through, we found that we overlapped on most of our really important values, even though the beliefs were different. And the rest were relative abstractions. Well, then there was this uh, another long pause. And then she said, now it has to be okay for me to go to church. And you'll notice this was not in the form of a question. And I said, well, of course it was okay. Uh, again, it's something that I already knew. But then I learned something I might not have known otherwise. I learned why it was so important for her to go to church. And it had nothing to do with theology. Her stepdad, a uh, former Baptist minister, had an ugly falling out with his church when he left his first wife for a second wife. So he cut all ties with the church, not just to that church, but all churches, all religion, and he didn't allow his wife and stepdaughters to go either. So Becca vowed to herself at the time that she was bloody well going to church once she got out of that house, and no one was ever going to keep her from it again. So it wasn't really religious uniformity she needed from me. She just needed to know that that particular bit of family history wasn't going to repeat itself. So it was never about salvation for her. As much as anything, her church going was kind of a, like an act of proxy redemption for her mom. And that was a good thing to know for me. She wasn't going to church because she was afraid of hell or even to please God. Those are things I would have found it hard to respect. It was about family and identity, which turns out to be true of a lot of religious people. Uh, this made it easier for me to go with her. And there was some really terrific research published about three years ago, a Harvard University of Wisconsin study, that found that the attraction of church is mostly social. It's not theological. It's mostly about connecting with other people, not connecting with God. So, again, I could get behind that. I went with her for several years. I eventually stopped for reasons that I describe in the book. And she went for about another year, and then she stopped as well. And uh, finally, after about 13 years of marriage, 
she decided with no pressure from me at all that she didn't believe anymore. So we were basically a mixed couple for 13 years. We've uh, been on the same side of the fence for about nine. Uh, but I didn't need her to make that change. We'd had very few problems in the mix. And I knew several other atheists who also had happy marriages to religious partners. But I also knew uh, several mixed couples personally who had a much tougher time, including a couple who had divorced as a direct result of that religious gap. And I was curious to know what accounted for that difference. Why do some couples do fine and others don't in that mix? So I started digging into the literature on mixed belief marriage. And, <laughs> man, uh, according to most of the books on the subject, marrying outside of your own belief system is a huge mistake that leads to unhappiness and divorce, period. That's it. Uh, let me give you some of the actual language that's in these books. Mixed belief marriage, and usually they're talking about marriages between two religious perspectives, but I'll call it mixed belief. It's said to be a regrettable choice, quote, made by starry-eyed young people who think that love will conquer all. That's a quote. And so they ignore the slow catastrophe of an interfaith marriage, which leads inevitably to tragic results, including unhappiness, shattered families, and bitter separation and divorce. You wouldn't believe the language in, this thing, in these things. They include phrases like, if you're determined to intermarry, and then they, they're followed by advice for getting the best out of a terrible situation. So I just thought, we, we must be doing it wrong, because we're doing just fine. Uh, over the years, I kept meeting people in secular religious marriages, and some of them were happy and some of them were not. There's a guy who came up to me after a talk in uh, North Carolina, I think it was, uh, a few years ago, and uh, he and his wife had both been Mormons, but his faith had been slipping for a long time. And uh, when he told her a week earlier that he no longer believed in God, she said he was sick and evil, and then she took the kids and left him the same night. Uh, and he hadn't heard from her since then, and he didn't know after a week where his own children were, and no one from either side of his family would talk to him. Now, wondering what accounts for that difference between his marriage and mine, for example, led to the book I've written now, In Faith and in Doubt, coming out in August. And um, when I went back to the literature to prepare for writing my own book, I started to see a pattern. Most of them, most of these authors are not concerned about individuals and their marriages. They're concerned about the effect that mixed belief marriage has on religious institutions. That is what they're worried about. So there's one called How to Prevent an Intermarriage. It's written by a rabbi, Kalman Pakuz, and it starts with this sentence, intermarriage is a recognized threat to the survival of the Jewish people. Bingo. That's what their concern is. There's another book written by a priest that says about the same thing about Catholicism. It goes on and on. You have to dig through all these statements to get at the truth. Uh, there's a Washington Post opinion piece that came out a couple of years ago uh, that said, in some circumstances, interfaith marriages are more likely to end in divorce than same-faith marriages. Did you catch the wording? Saying interfaith marriages are more likely to divorce in some circumstances, it like, it's like saying guys named Steve are more likely to divorce in some circumstances. It's true, and it's completely meaningless. So I kept digging deeper to get beyond the uh, opinion of these people to get some actual research. And I discovered, of course, that their results are all cherry-picked. There's a study from about seven years ago, Valer and Ellison, that said uh, their conclusion was, the belief dissimilarity of spouses has little effect on the likely dissolution of the marriage. And a 2009 study said uh, there is, quote, no difference in marital satisfaction between people who were married to partners of the same faith and people married to partners of a different faith. The difference just evaporates once you get into actual uh, research. Some of, some of these couples have trouble. Uh, some of couples in other situations have trouble as well. But the fact that the uh, difference in uh, religious beliefs in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to divorce is good news because mixed belief marriage is on the rise. It's becoming much more common. 27% of all U.S. married couples now claim different religious or non-religious identities. And uh, a lot of people think that the secular religious gap has to be especially hard because the gap is so wide. They just immediately assume it's the ultimate mixed marriage. But I actually think they have an advantage over couples with two religions. And once I started looking into these details and uh, ran my own survey, you could, you could see this. The seculars don't bring a set playbook into the mix. 
we have our own values and preferences, but they're not written into a set of formal expectations, and that allows for more flexibility in the marriage. But if you have two established religions, you often get practical conflicts about what you're supposed to do when a child is born or turns 13 or what to do on a particular calendar day or at a wedding or when somebody dies. Uh, but that's not always enough. I still wanted to find out why some couples have more trouble than others in this mix. So I ran a survey last year, about a thousand people who are in secular religious marriages and conducted 17 interviews. And a picture starts to emerge of what's helpful and what's not. So uh, here are some of the flags that I found for conflict, things that came up over and over again in these couples. Uh, and if these flags are present, they're more likely to have conflict in the, in the marriage. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to get divorced, but they have a tougher time. The big one is if the couple shared a worldview when they got married and then one of them changed. That turns out to be the biggest stressor. Uh, my wife and I we're already different, we already had an understanding of that when we were married, and so things tend to go better. But if they were both Mormon or they're both Pentecostal, and one of them becomes an atheist, that's actually the most common is uh, um, both religious and then one becomes an atheist, not the other way. Uh, that's a huge stressor, it's a tremendous source of conflict. Um, if both partners identify intensely with their worldview, that's a high source of conflict. A big desire to convert the other partner, this is a killer. If you've got two people, both of whom express a really strong desire to convert the other person, um, that is a, a tremendous source of tension and conflict, and uh, all sorts of it pops out in all sorts of different ways uh, uh, in the marriage. A mild desire, you know, a hope in the back of your mind that sometime the other person might convert. There's nothing wrong with that. It's this active desire to change the other person uh, that runs into troubles. If the non-religious partner is an anti-theist. That's, that creates more difficulties. If the religious partner is a member of certain conservative denominations, that's difficult. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Pentecostalism, Evangelicals, those are the ones with the highest correlation to uh, stress and, uh, and conflict. And then if the marriage has other high-risk factors, like they were really young when they got married, their parents were divorced, or there's a big age difference, lots of these understood uh, aspects of uh, difficulty in a marriage. If you've already got those things, it'll tend to bring the religious differences up to the surface and uh, cause that to fester a little more. Uh, so um, uh, then I came across some things that are just more helpful um, to the relationship. If you talk about it early, that helps. If it's not revealed 10 years into the marriage, it's very helpful. If you sit down and define your negotiables and non-negotiables, so you talk about here's something that I'd prefer but here's something I really have to insist on. Um, those are the things you can get sorted out between yourselves and, and find out that you have a lot more common ground than you thought. Uh, taking the time to learn about each other's worldviews is a helpful thing. Uh, if you have a religious partner, for example, who knows nothing about atheism whatsoever, uh, they have less of a tendency to be understanding and empathetic about it. Uh, and vice versa, if the atheist partner doesn't know much about religion, although that's less, uh, less common. Um, Another big one is uh, raising the kids uh, unlabeled. It's extremely helpful if the couple can agree that they're going to raise the kids to make, a, make up their own minds and make their own decisions in the long run. Uh, and an awful lot of religious, despite what we often think, a lot of religious parents are perfectly fine with that. So they'll give their kids you know, the experience of going to church, learning the stories and that sort of thing, but they are also free to ask questions and they communicate directly to their kids that they can make up their own minds. That's when you get a healthy situation when they have that agreement. So uh, the book itself is built around the stories of eight couples in uh, different configurations. Um, uh, several, uh, there are a couple of uh, Baptist atheist couples, there's a uh, Catholic and uh, secular humanist couple. Most fascinating, one of the most fascinating ones, uh, they were Catholic and atheist when they got married and they switched the atheist became uh, a Baptist, and the Catholic became an atheist uh, over the course of their marriage. That's a fascinating one. Um, but then lots of other, there's a, a one who's a, a non-religious um, person married to a Hindu, uh, so we, which is a different set of issues. It's not the same. Uh, so that I use those eight narratives spread through the book to really illustrate uh, uh, some of these best practices and worst practices. And... Uh, um, I, I think I like the way it turned out. We've got the survey to, uh, uh, to sort of fill in the background, but then you're, you're able to follow these couples um, through the book. So 
Uh, again, it comes out in August. It's already active on Facebook and Twitter if you want to look those up. So uh, please join the conversation uh, anytime, and thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate being here. Um, thanks, Dale. Uh, that's really interesting to me because I think I mentioned to you when you started the book that I'm the product of a mixed yeah. uh, religious marriage myself. Uh, my, my father and stepmother, and they got married when I was nine. Uh, so 37 years now they've been married. Uh, and yeah. my father is a lifelong atheist. Uh, and my stepmother, when they got married, was sort of a mild-mannered Methodist. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, over the course of the next 15 years or so, she sort of slid further and further uh, into fundamentalism. And, and when I think I was about 15 when she, we had gone to the Methodist church and she decided to change over to the Assembly of God, which is like a big step up in, in, uh, oh, yeah. in you know, intensity, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I went with her for a couple of weeks and just said, though, this is not for me. These these people scare me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I went back um, and stayed in the Methodist church. Um, and then uh, a few years after that, she ended up leaving the Assembly of God and joining this sort of splinter faction, uh, this sort of offshoot um, of the Pentecostal church, uh, which is, uh, they're called Heart to Heart Ministries. And it's a group of almost entirely women, about 25 or 30 women, uh, led by a, a woman named Joan Hart, very nice lady, who considers herself, and they consider her, a prophetess. Okay. Rather than a pastor. Right. I have been dying for 20 years to ask how they reconcile that with women aren't supposed to teach, you know, <laughs> and all of that in the Bible, but I, it's, I know I'll get sort of a, a nonsensical oh, yeah. answer, so I don't... Oh, yeah. I don't bother asking, <clears throat> but uh, and, and you mentioned that if if one of them sort of really holds out this need to convert the other one, that that's one of the sort of problems in these. And my uh, the, the prophetess had a prophecy about I don't know, twenty years ago or so that my father was going to convert to Christianity and become an evangelist. Really? Um, yeah, and he is now seventy-eight years old. So time's running pretty short for this to happen, um, and, and it seems awfully unlikely. I'm sure that that my stepmother absolutely still believes it, yeah, um, because God wouldn't lie. You know, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. and and I I don't I don't want to. I always hesitate to talk about this stuff because it makes it sound like I'm cutting on my stepmother, who was a really terrific woman. Yeah, uh, she really is, and and she lives the good parts of her religion. Um, you know, she really does take care of people. She really does care about people. Yeah. She spent a decade taking care of my uncle when he was uh, fighting AIDS, you know, with no right. judgment, no, you know, I mean, right. she, and she just said that's what Jesus would do, you know. So I give her tremendous credit for a lot of that, but it sure. was a little odd uh, growing up with that, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, it really is. And and that um, that idea of uh, <clears throat> that she changed, that she, you know, went up a step in intensity and all that sort of thing, that's another thing that was fascinating and difficult in this book is uh, it's a moving target. It's always a moving, everybody's a moving target. Right. I'm a different kind of atheist than I was when I was in my 20s. Yeah. And so you get people who marry, not only are they, do they have particular religious perspectives, but then they will change over the course of the marriage. And one of the things that's incredibly common is you get the mix, you know, people marry atheists and a Catholic, for example, and uh, the Catholic is moderate. Um, but then they have kids. Um, having kids turns out to be the thing that kicks a lot of uh, religious um, uh, believers into sort of high gear, and they and they come back to the either they drifted away from the church entirely and they come back, or they were still in the church and they deepen their intensity. Uh, there's one of the eight couples that um, I interview. She was a a Baptist, uh, but a very easygoing, jokey Baptist, married to an atheist, swears, drinks, you know, the whole thing. And uh, then had her son, and suddenly was overwhelmed with the idea that she was responsible for this child with a soul. And so they began fighting all the time about their, uh, about their religion, where for 12 years of marriage, they had never fought about it. Uh, so it's, it is interesting how the, uh, the different things that can kick it into gear and cause the intensity to change one direction or another, and then the conflict goes up or down. Is there anything, do you talk in the book at all, or did you do any research on, on the effect this has on children? Did you interview any of the children from these? I didn't interview the children, only interviewed the parents about the children. 
Um, but uh, I've seen from my other work, from uh, in Parenting Beyond Belief and Raising Free Thinkers, enough of what happens with the kids. Um, kids are way more adaptable and flexible than we give them credit for. And one of the things that is frequently said in uh, interfaith marriage books, the ones that are saying it can't work, is that children will be confused by having parents of uh, two different uh, religions. Well, I found that that is actually rarely the case. Kids accept the world as it's presented to them. And so if they're born into a family where mom believes one thing, dad believes something else, they say, oh, I see, mom believes one thing and dad believes something else. That's, right. uh, that's what they accept okay. as the reality. Right. And that's actually, I, I considered it to be an advantage we had when my wife was a Christian um, in raising our kids because I really wanted to raise them with the opportunity to make up their own minds about these things. And it was so easy to say, here's what I think is true, believe it with all my heart, be sure you go talk to mom because I know she believes differently. We had this sort of built-in in the home, you know, two different perspectives, and then we'd say, and you get to make up your own mind, change your mind a thousand times if you want, we will love you no less no matter what you decide. That's really, really healthy. Well, now we're both secular humanists. That's great in a way, but it's also uh, we lost a little bit of that sort of in-home diversity that made it so easy to do that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting that it actually... Uh, it's one of several advantages that these couples have actually talk about uh, in their marriage. And that's totally my perspective from having grown up in that. I'm really glad to have been brought up in that situation because the biggest thing that it meant for me was I didn't have a default belief. Right. Almost everyone. Right. It, you know, whatever your parents are, that's what you are. If you're raised right. Catholic, you're Catholic. I couldn't do that. And right. But the result of that was that I actually had to think these things through. I couldn't that's just blindly go along and 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 there was a time in my teenage years uh, from about you know 12 to, to 17 or 18 when I was one of the leaders of our local youth for Christ mm -hmm. I took it very seriously um, right. and, and, and was very devout about it and then started asking questions and you know I won't go into my whole deconversion story but over the course of a year or two I, I became an atheist and uh, and I remember my saying to my dad much later you know as an adult why didn't you ever challenge me on this? Why didn't you ever say, you know, I think you're wrong, never try to talk me out of it, you know? And he said, you know, I just figured I had raised you to think for yourself and you would figure it out on your own. Just the, do you imagine if all parents said that? I mean, yeah. just had that simple approach. Uh, it would just be a, a revolution in parenting. It really would. Yeah, I, I really appreciate having been raised that way now. Yeah. Um, and, and appreciate the diversity of it. So I, I totally get that. It would be really interesting to do another book on just the children's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly would. There you go. There's your next book. <laughs> All right, good. I was looking for your project. <laughs> so uh, to wrap this up, I do want to talk a little bit about a fundraising project. Um, one of the things we like to do at Free Thought Blogs is, is raise funds for good causes. Uh, and last year, uh, 2013, we raised a little over $10,000. Uh, for uh, the uh, Light the Night uh, campaign for uh, leukemia and lymphoma research. Uh, Greta Christina, uh, w who was last year's sort of honored hero for the Light the Night Foundation, uh, or Light the Night Project, uh, w was a big part of this. And, uh, and this year we're raising money for a couple of other things, and one of them is um, acid attacks, uh, which are a very common occurrence in many parts of the world. Uh, women are almost always the victims uh, of these attacks. There are also men and children who are scarred by acid. Uh, it's an easy crime to commit and very hard to police and the results are absolutely um, devastating. Uh, victims of acid attacks are effectively removed from public life forever out of shame uh, or fear or, or being made pariahs in their communities. Uh, many of the victims are abandoned by society uh, and it's easy to obtain uh, cheap uh, acids uh, to throw at victims. Normally they target the face and the head. Uh, the goal is usually to blind and disfigure. Uh, and the extent of the damage often distracts the public from apprehending the attacker, so a lot of them go unpunished. Um, plastic surgery can help some of the victims, um, speech therapy, that sort of thing. But in many parts of the world where this goes on, there's not a lot of access to medical, uh, legal, and psychological help. So to this end, <coughs> excuse me, Free Thought Blogs, and FTB Conscience 2 is raising money for the Acid Survivors Trust International. ASTI are the only charity dedicated specifically to combating acid violence. And they've set up partnerships around the world to help with access to medical care and so forth. Our goal is to raise at least $4,000 uh, 
uh, for this. And Avicenna of A Million Gods um, is going to help raise awareness by hiking in, in ne Nepal in 2015 and visiting the victims of, of, of acid and kerosene burns. He is collecting for his ticket to Nepal and the equipment and the initial pledge of uh, $500. So if you'd like to help uh, donate to Avi's equipment and flights, uh, his PayPal link is on his blog, which is freethoughtblogs.com forward slash a million gods. If you'd like to donate to ASTI, uh, you can go to Avicenna's fundraiser page, which is at www.justgiving.com forward slash a million gods. And this fundraiser link is also displayed under the very important links uh, on ftbcon. Uh, dot org. So uh, uh, again, if you if you got a few dollars you could spare for that, that's uh, certainly a good cause. Yeah. Dale, of course, is the founder of the Foundation Beyond Belief, which is the largest organization around uh, dedicated to channeling resources from uh, the atheist and humanist community uh, toward causes like this. Uh, and it's something that, that, that he and I both are really big on um, and, and something that we think the community just needs to do as, as much of it as we can. Uh, to help out people uh, in need. It's, it's putting humanism, as we often say at Foundation of Belief, putting humanism into action. Instead of just sitting and talking about what we believe, you need to actually do something about it. So uh, so that is it for our introduction. Welcome again to FTBCon2. Uh, going all weekend, go to ftbcon.org uh, for schedule uh, of all of the events, and we hope that you enjoy. There's uh, some amazing panel discussions uh, going on, including Dale's going to be back for one about parenting. Uh, parenting Beyond Belief, and um, and so that's sort of his area of expertise. So again, welcome to FTV Con 2. We hope you enjoy it, and um, we hope you'll see you uh, in a whole bunch of the other audiences. Thanks. <laughs>